very difficult. It's also, you know, all the cliches, uh, tragedy plus time is comedy. You know, all, and it's all true. There's certain things you're just not ready to laugh at. What is the most important business lesson you've learned throughout your years? Sign your own checks. <laughs> Never give away your power of attorney, ever, ever. They can find you in deepest, darkest Africa. You want to be busy, you want to be pushing forward. You can never sit back and say, oh, look where I've come, because you've come nowhere. You must be going forward. And that's all about looking at your calendar and saying, what can I do now? get this going even to another level. When I said, I want to go into show business, I mean, they didn't talk to me for two years, oh, close to two years. Really? Yes, really. So these two years, yeah. Yeah, I, I suppose there'll be some kind of allowance coming in from your parents. It Nothing. Wasn't, really? There was no money. There was no, uh, once my father tried to have me committed, <laughs> that was the only thing that went on during those two years. Committed he came. in what sense? It, really to a... Really, I don't know if he really would have done it. But uh, they were so angry with me. I think for Joan Rivers, she was going into comedy at a time when it was a more unusual pursuit, certainly for someone in the middle classes and certainly, of course, for a woman. Um, and so she was doing something in incredibly trailblazing. It, it is extraordinary to think back that when she said she wanted to become a comedian, her father, and I don't think this is a joke, I think this was true, had threatened to put her in, in, in an institution. The idea of women, you know, people say she was a terrible role model for women because she was so horrible to other women, and that is certainly the case. She was horrible to and about women on stage all the time. But it's very easy to judge somebody by the standards of now rather than their own standards. And it's really easy to judge somebody who was sufficiently ahead of their time that when they started their profession, people threatened to do what they have always threatened to do with women who speak out, which is lock them up and call them mad. Do you see similarities between the relationship you have with Melissa and the relationship you had with your own mother? I see, um, yeah, and it makes me terribly sad that I see that because I know after I'm dead, she's going to go, my mother was right, I should have listened to her more. Or, gee, I wonder if I hurt my mother when I said that. And she will never think that until her son says something to her and she'll go, I should I didn't even tell my mother I was moving to, El to Los Angeles till it was all done. You know what I'm saying? I never even said, what do you think? You think I should go? I just called her up one day and said, we're going next month. Was she terribly hurt? My mother never said a thing to me, but she said to a friend, it broke my heart. Never said a thing. Look at this, I can't discuss it. But that's mothers and daughters. Mothers and daughters, you kill for each other. You love each other. No one will ever love you the way a mother loves you. Ever, ever, ever. A daughter doesn't know how much she relies on her mother. They think they're all so strong, and they can be 65 when the mother goes. They suddenly go, how am I going to live without my mother? It's very complicated. Um, what do you think are the special challenges facing a young woman starting a business? And what is the best piece of advice you can give to a young woman starting a business? Joan, do you want to answer this? Yeah, question? forget young woman. Uh, if you've got it, you've got it. If, if Adolf Hitler came back with a good idea, we'd say, and I, this sounds terrible and I'm Jewish, but you'd say, well, let's <laughs> think about it, and he's changed, he's grown. I mean, uh, a good idea is a good idea, and, and it's a terrible thing. I, what I'm trying to say is, don't say, as a woman, just do it. Screw him. You're smarter, you're better, you're brighter. Go for it. I know what it's like to have nothing, to wake up, and I'm a busy woman. I've worked since I was 16 and to wake up and have nowhere to go and nothing to do. So I'd rather have a busy plate, thank you. Another obstacle Joan overcame was getting shut out of late night by her own mentor, Johnny Carson. Joan fought through her feelings. Her show went head to head against Johnny. I think he was furious. He felt betrayed. I was now a competitor. He literally had me blacklisted. But Joan's show crashed and burned. The man blamed for it all was the producer, Joan's husband, Edgar Rosenberg. And not long after Fox canceled it, Joan and Edgar separated. He went into a deep depression and his health fell apart. He was drowning. And I said, I cannot help you. You must go for help. You must get help. You can't pull me down because I'm not. I was drowning too. I had been fired and publicly humiliated and left for dead along with my husband. 
And I said, you've got to get help, and he wouldn't get help. Edgar committed suicide in 1987 by taking an overdose of prescription pills in a Philadelphia hotel room. My daughter came into the room, and she said, uh, sit down, I have something terrible to tell you. And I just said, just tell me, don't. And she said, they found Daddy. And uh, my poor daughter had the burden of time. He left us high and dry. Everything just went to smithereens. And he left me with no career and a lot of debts because he wasn't a good businessman. Joan mourned, and then she devoted herself to her daughter Melissa and her own work. Stand up after stand up, she rebuilt her life around the things she loved, her family, and being funny. I'm always very in awe of, of people that sing. I sang once for Barbara Streisand, this is a true story, and her eyes crossed the other way. It was just... And boy, those knocks came. I mean, my firing from Fox, and on top of that, my husband's death. And um, on top of that, I was locked out of late night television. And uh, he, there was no place for me to work for a while. And you just, every morning I would wake up and just say, I've just got to break through, I've just got to get it again. The interesting thing about you, though, is how different you can be in the different aspects of your career. When you're on Fashion Police, you're doing jokes, zinging celebrities over what they're wearing. But when you're on QVC selling your clothing or your beauty line, you're sort of that helper type. So I'm curious, which persona is closer to the real you? Who are you like? We're all such different, you know, there's so many aspects to all our personalities. Uh, it depends on what the assignment is. Uh, the, my assignment on Fashion Police is to tell the truth. And my job, my allegiance is to my audience. And my audience, I always think of, would be friends. If I was sitting in my living room and we were looking at these pictures, this is what I would say about so-and-so. This is what I would say about so-and-so. So that's Fashion Police. Uh, on QVC, my allegiance is to ladies that I want to make them look better. And I have said on QVC, a host will say, well, this goes with that, because they want to sell both. And I'll say, no, it doesn't, because I don't want them to look like fools. So it, it's always really who my audience is, that I want to be, I want to be truthful. It really is about taking risk. But that's what I am in real life. I can't stand political correctness. It, I think, is one of the reasons that the society is just falling to pieces. We're all so terrified to say anything. Everyone is pulling the race card. You know, every, whether I'm a woman and you touch me, oh, calm down. And that's why you fired me. We fired you because you're stupid. That's why we fired, you know. I am probably the, I, I must have done something in a previous life because I've had a great career. But I've also, I work hard at it, but I love it. So it feels like you look how hard you work. But I love what I do. So that's not work. So Fox was starting up, and we went over to Fox, and they offered me my own nighttime show in direct opposition to Carson. And I was ready for it. I mean, I wasn't, I was, I was ready for it. And that went along uh, from the beginning. It was hard. My husband had had a nervous breakdown and uh, was very shaky. And he came up against Rupert Murdoch, and there was friction from the beginning. And finally, uh, the numbers were fine. Everyone always thinks the show tanked. It didn't. We did very well. They, from the day one, they were in the black. It's all very boring, but it's, it's such a sore subject with me. They called me on a Thursday afternoon. Here I go. And they said, you can stay, but your husband can never come on the set again or on and my husband was having a nervous breakdown then. And I said, uh, I go with my husband. And that was the end of everything for about eight years. Very tough times. And uh, I was off television. NBC put out terrible releases and I had left Carson. Uh, Fox put out releases. Our numbers weren't good. My husband committed suicide over it three weeks after it happened. Uh, Vegas said we don't want a woman working whose husband has committed suicide. It was just a very difficult time. <laughs> so, rough times. Shall we cut for a moment or two? No, I'm fine. <laughs> Take one second just so we can fix the makeup. 
when you said it were off for a m number of years, did that mean that your, your possibilities of keeping your career at that level had gone for gone. 12 years? So does that mean that not only were you not on primetime television for your sort of talent, um, but all sorts of other... It affects everything. ...routes were blocked? Of course. They forget about you. But I wasn't going to go down in the flames. And I think um, I found every other way in. I found morning television. I did a morning show. I went on daytime shows. I went on any show that wanted me. Everybody knew the stories, like a little show business inside story. I was just, they tried to destroy me. It, it, it sounds so dramatic. I just figured, you're not going to. I just thought if I'm going to be funny enough, you're going to have to let me back. And that's what happened. You have to. When her husband, Edgar, committed suicide, literally the first joke she told when she went back on stage after that had happened was, I knew I shouldn't have taken the bag off my head when we were having sex. Now, of course you could argue, and I'm sure people have, that she is, was a, a sort of sociopathic person who could turn such horrific personal tragedy into that kind of cheap joke. I would argue she was using it as exactly the right kind of catharsis for her. Um, it's a constant mistake made about comedians that when they make jokes about something, they are making light of it, uh, to quote the people who criticise them. She was giving it her full professional attention. You cannot take it more seriously than that as a comedian. And you know from looking at the interview she did for, for example, the South Bank show decades later that just talking about that period in her life made her start to cry. The pain didn't not exist for her. It's simply that she chose to turn it into comedy. And I think people who aren't comedians or don't understand comedy often find that impossible to kind of believe. Coming, uh, growing up in Brooklyn, you were, you went to Barnard College. Yeah. And ended up Phi Beta Kappa. Yeah. Uh, and what I was surprised to read was that you studied anthropology. Anthropology. Why? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's fascinating. Yeah. It still fascinates me. Yeah. I, I get so, to go into an area Ephesus in Greece, and they dig down, you find an entire civilization, mm -hmm. and then you figure out what was happening there. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. Had you not entered show business, would have you stayed with anthrop anthropology? My joke now is, <laughs> yes, if I could have brought along a hair and makeup girl. But uh, <laughs> I think I probably would have. Certainly uh, yeah. anthropology and, and philosophy. That was my minor. Once you, you Phi Beta Kappa graduated from Barnard, uh, came back to New York City and you decided you were going to make your mark in show business as a stand-up comic? No, actress. As an actress. And I read somewhere, which I was surprised, and I think it's a good lesson for a lot of people watching tonight who think that it's easy to make it in show business. It's very hard, but I'll give, conversely, can I talk mm, about this? Sure, talent? sure. This is the lucky part. If you've really got talent, every friend mm -hmm, of mine really mm -hmm. had talent that didn't go into drugs or that didn't, that worked at it, mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. made it a thing. Made it. Those that stuck with it. Stuck with it, but really worked at it. I mean, mm -hmm. I went to every audition, uh, tried to get into every play, made it. And those, uh, it's, it's amazing, no one got left behind. But then I was thinking, in, in, in 19, I, what was it, 1965, was that your big right. break on yeah. The Tonight Show? Yeah. That was like seven years after you start in show yeah. business. And, and I was wondering, I said, if Joan hadn't struggled and honed her craft in these clubs, uh, would have she been ready when she got her, her big break? No, and I think that's why. It's a wonderful question. Yeah. Nobody's ever asked me that before. Oh, good. So good Thank for you. you. <laughs> but uh, that's a very good question. Okay. Uh, uh, people don't get it. Once you hit, that's when you start to work. Sure. If you're smart. Of course. And that's why you see so many kids with one records, you know, one record wonders, or whatever mm -hmm, they call them, mm -hmm. and so many people that will go into one sitcom and never heard of again. They don't get it. That's the time to get busy and say, okay, I'm lucky. I've made it this far. I'm going to make sure I have a, a solid base. And I, I really always have worked very hard at it. Were you surprised that when you first appeared on The Tonight Show that you were such a big hit? I couldn't put my thoughts around it. I got on The Tonight Show because <laughs> Bill Cosby was a friend of mine. Okay. And the night before he was on, and a comic that was mm -hmm, on that night mm -hmm. was so bad, Bill said to them, Joan couldn't be worse. Right. It was a literally true story. Yeah. Nobody's wow. worse than that guy, so use her. Okay. And so I got on by mistake. And when I finally got on, I just knew 
I'm very lucky and I better go right and start writing my next shot immediately. Mm -hmm. And I never mm -hmm. stop. I still do it. Sure. What made you set up your own business and go into business? I was starving. Not starving, but I was, I was scratching and scrounging. And they came to me again and they said, do you want to sell jewelry on television? And that was, at the, now everybody does it. In those days, it was the bottom of the barrel. They would take dead celebrities and work their mouths. And I said, how much? Sure, whatever. And they said, design some jewelry you would wear. And it worked. And I loved it. it. Became a business. And I was smart enough to treat it like a business. And I really loved it. I now run the business with the largest fashion jewelry company in the United States. But I'm still playing a role. I still think of myself as Joan Crawford in a movie. I go to work and I lead my team to victory. So you're a mogul. I'm a mogul. <laughs> I, I have a couple of questions. We had emails tonight. People knew you were going to be coming oh, on great. our show. And two people, a friend from Staten Island, who's a big fan, wants to, wants to know, what do you attribute your enormous amount of energy to? Luck and vitamins. I have been a vitamin freak all my life. If you said to me tonight, oh, and I drink, you know, Joan, and I take uh, an extra grapefruit every day, I'd go, I got to get vitamin C, grapefruit. You pill. try it. I do packets in the morning and packets at night of vitamins. Because your fans know Forever. the true extent of your schedule. Yeah. Whatever vitamins, you can do. Vitamins, vitamins, vitamins. And I always say in coffee and M&Ms. <laughs> <laughs> you exercise? And, yes. Okay, that helps yeah, a lot. I exercise. What advice do you have to give to a young comic today? Man Send or me woman? Money. No, 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 no. <laughs> Serious. What work would you tell them? Anywhere, any place, anytime. That's all. Just work. And listen to what the audience thinks is funny and keep that and throw out everything else. Look back today with all that you've accomplished, so, and you're in so many things, jewelry. I can't even name them all. Uh, what kind of career did you visualize for yourself back then? Writing. You wanted I, to be I, a I writer. I wanted to do writing uh, and do uh, comedy writing and straight writing, television plays, movies, yeah. And, 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 comes and you're writing. Everything comes back to the written word in our business. Comedy is, is written, but I also perform it. Absolutely. Yeah. Are you as, as just as driven today as you were when you were on Candid Camera? More. When you, when you were writing More for them? More, because it's harder when you're older. It's another mountain to climb. Do you feel any taboo subjects inside you? Do you feel, no, I can't really talk about that? If I can talk about it, then I figure it's not taboo. And certain things I won't talk about. Such as? It depends on the moment. But, <laughs> but uh, uh, I think um, pr death of a child, very difficult. It's also, you know, all the cliches, uh, tragedy plus time is comedy, you know, all, and it's all true. There's certain things you're just not ready to laugh at. I know most of the viewers watching tonight will not be aware that you've been so diversified in your career. I was not aware. You, you've been well, a you don't wear jewelry. <laughs> you know, you don't I do, I do. <laughs> You've been a comedian. Yes. You've been a best-selling author. Right. You design jewelry. Yes, major jewelry on QVC. You've been an actress because I remember you in the, uh, with uh, The Swimmer. Yeah. But yeah. I liked Burt Lancaster, yeah, so I remember I, that movie. One of the meanest white men alive. Was he? <laughs> I hate to break your heart. <laughs> but and, a very a wonderful actor. But you were an actress. You've been a screenwriter. Yeah. Director. Yeah. Talk show host. Anything. And a playwright. Yes. I, I have another play coming on Broadway in January, my fourth. And of all these different areas in show business uh so you know multi-dimensional was that your plan or did it, was that did that evolve as the years went on no i have, i have no plan no plan i at still all. have I, I look at people with great awe and admiration that have a plan mm -hmm. if it works but if you have sure. a plan it doesn't work then you're an idiot stop the plan right i just as i said i'm hit and miss mm -hmm. but that's mm -hmm. show business as you know mm -hmm. is um you have 30 balloons up in the air, and you pray that one will come down sure. and be, be the lucky one. Uh, and of all the things I just mentioned, if you were only able to do one, what would that be? What pays the most? Is that true? No. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope it would be something that you love the most, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> How much is my mantra? <laughs> no, uh, uh, I don't, I'd probably stand up. What's, what, today, what's the best thing? about being Joan Rivers today? Right now? Yeah. Sitting here and talking. It's a great, it's a great, 
It's a great moment. Laughing with you, talking. What is the best business lesson you had to learn? Uh, oh, always before you have someone sign a big contract for your stuff, put a roofie into their drink. <laughs> 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 Works like a charm. Uh, uh, the best business lesson is, and again, it's in your... <laughs> Again, it's in your book. Quality. You have to be proud of your product. I don't care what it is. You have to really believe, believe in your product and believe this is the best there is. Whether it's my comedy or it's my, my, my physical things that I make. That's it. What about, don't you think? Totally, I, I, totally agree. One more. <laughs> if I had been a man, it would have been much, a much easier time. Uh, they just weren't ready to hear things come out of a woman's mouth. You can't say that. You say, would you say that to Robin Williams? Would you say this, that to Richard Pryor? No, then why are you saying that to me? But perhaps I wanted seven years of struggle. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have wanted seven years of ketchup soup. I wouldn't have wanted seven years of sneaking out of windows when you bombed or not being paid and waiting for, for, for checks that never came. But I'm, I'm, glad I, I'm glad I paid my dues. A girl, a girl, you're 30 years old. You're not married. You're an old maid. A man, he's 90 years old, he's not married, he's a catch. It's a whole different thing. And through her own will and determination, she became the most celebrated female comic of her time. As a child, I was like, one day I'll be in Hollywood, one day I'll be in Hollywood, I'll, I'll, I'll be a star. And then suddenly there you are in cement, and that's wonderful. Also now when people spit on me, I don't have to be there. <laughs> no one should go into our business unless it's a calling. It is, if you can do anything else you must because it is the meanest meanest most difficult business and people with great talent sometimes don't get anywhere it, there's so many variables besides the talent um so uh I, I had this call i had no choice i really had no choice i remember hearing you say one time that you wanted seven percent of the audience to leave shocked yes how come because that means you've shaken them and made them wake up to face things they haven't faced. Lovely to see you. Happy to be here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no. I like theater. taking them and saying, look at this. Whether the, it goes back to political correctness. Mm -hmm. For God's sake, stop and look at this. And uh, so comedy is rough. And uh, I like that. I like that you can talk about things that everyone says you can't talk about. Yes, you can. Let's. Our times are such tough times and there are no boundaries anywhere in life so there's certainly not going to be any boundaries on on stage for a comedian we're told every day we may go to war and in new york we're waiting to be blown up i mean you have no idea every day since 9 11 is a given day so i think it's very rough times i hope her legacy will continue to be that of somebody who was prepared to tell jokes that most people would not tell at a time when most people wouldn't do them. We lionise Lenny Bruce for exactly the same qualities, but because Joan Rivers lasted a long time, it, it became very easy to see her sort of, you know, what a joke, because she was an old woman, because she had plastic surgery, because of all the things that, you know, we can't bear. Women should just sort of disappear and we can hide them in a cupboard and then we don't have to think about them. Um, and because she continued to, to push boundaries, because she became, if anything, more shocking as she got older rather than less, because she could get away with saying worse things on TV without getting put in jail, um, I hope she reminds us that comedy should push at the edges of what we find acceptable. I'm going to be cremated. You're going to be cremated. You're too young to think about this. Except I'm scared. What if they lose the ashes? You always hear these stories. What if, they, what if I end up being snorted by Whitney Houston? What if I end up... That could happen. I could be mixed into a bag or something, you know? I could end up with Bobby Brown's ass. I mean, it's just... I worry. Sure, you wouldn't give a shit if it happened to me.